All right, so we are in part two this morning of a four-part series, Lord willing, on building and rebuilding unity. And I'm approaching the subject of unity with ministry teams in mind primarily. In my context with Finisterre, um, we want to help churches send church planting ministry teams to Papua New Guinea, and we are zealous for them to be well-equipped to build unity with one another, and then to rebuild a unity if it gets lost. If you felt last week like part one was undercover marriage counseling, like maybe your spouse called me or something, and um, is this look, this is just um, a shoe that fits all of us in relationships, doesn't it? Um, so there's really nothing in particular by focusing on a ministry team that excludes marriage relationships, uh, parenting relationships with your kids and with your parents. Um, this fits, this is a one size fits all relationship shoe. Um, so no, I didn't talk to your spouse and they didn't talk to me. Last week, we talked also about how we are at our wisest when we realize that every relationship or partnership, ministry partnership, is in one of these two categories at any point. You are either in your relationship building it unity, or you are in the process of needing to rebuild unity. And every relationship falls into one of those two categories. And I hope this morning it'll even be clearer to you that you are required as a believer in Jesus Christ to either be building unity or rebuilding unity with other believers. And last week in our introduction, I made the distinction between disagreements and conflict. Conflict in a relationship or in a ministry team, you must resolve that. You must eliminate that from your ministry partnership. Disagreement within your ministry partnership may not be the exact same thing as conflict. At least it doesn't have to be the same thing as conflict. Just because you disagree on a parenting method, just because as a ministry team, you're not in complete agreement on what you think the next step should be for you, that doesn't mean that you are automatically in conflict and that has to change. Do you understand? Relationships need to be able to bear disagreement in a Christ-honoring way. Listen carefully. We need to be able to bear disagreement with one another in a winsome way. That I can disagree with you and you can disagree with me and we can both walk away and say, man, I just am so glad I'm in partnership with that guy, with that woman. I'm really glad I have her as my mom. I really love that kid even when we disagree. We have to be able to bear disagreement in a winsome way in our relationships. But that requires a great deal of spiritual maturity. It takes spiritual maturity to not allow every disagreement to degenerate into a conflict. Can you disagree with others in a winsome way? Still, by way of introduction this morning, I actually want to highlight that distinction between disagreement and conflict just a little bit more. So what I want to do is I'm going to put conflict on this side in your mind, and over here I'm going to give you a vocabulary list from the Bible of things that are not necessarily automatically, conf uh, automatically disagreement. So let's start with that word conflict first. Turn to James chapter 4, verse 1. First off, the word conflict itself actually is a biblical term. It's a good word. You know it. James chapter 4, verse 1. James says, what is the source of quarrels and what? Conflicts among you. And he's going down to the source. He's saying this needs to not be this way in your relationships. That word conflict carries a negative connotation in the passage. It is not acceptable to um, exist in the church relationship. He makes it clear that it's not to be tolerated in fellowship or in the unity of the church. The word itself has a battle sense to it, which is always a threat to unity. Now, dis disagreements can be handled in a way that they don't devolve into a conflict. But whenever disagreement does turn into a conflict, then it's time that conflict 
must be resolved and unity needs to be rebuilt. Now, you see in chapter 4, verse 1, there's another word to add into our vocabulary list. So, disagreement doesn't have to be conflict. What's the, what's the other word in verse 1? It's the first one. What is the source of what? Quarrels. That doesn't sound like a good thing in a relationship because it's not. Quarrels doesn't have to be a disagreement, right? If conflicts has a battle sense to it, then this word quarrels even more so does. It carries with it the idea of hostility and antagonism. Now you're being hostile towards one another. Now they're being antagonistic towards you. Now disagreement can be handled in such a way that the disagreement doesn't become hostile. It doesn't have to become antagonistic. You can be on the same page about that, but it depends on you and me and how we're going to conduct ourselves in the disagreement. And when a disagreement does start to produce a hostile or hostility between you and your uh, ministry partnership, it's, it's time to resolve that quarrel and it's time to rebuild unity. So disagreement doesn't have to be conflict. Disagreement doesn't have to be a quarrel. Third word, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. Will you turn there with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. We're going to look for another vocabulary word. It's in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 3. Now, I want to draw your attention first to the word fleshly in, that occurs twice. At the beginning of 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3, Paul says, you are still fleshly. And then just skip a few words and he says, are you not fleshly? All right, so what is the expression? What does that fleshliness look like? He tells you there is jealousy, and here's our word, strife among you. Are you not fleshly when that's there? That word carries the sense of engaging in a rivalry with one another. Discord exists. Contention with one another exists. A disagreement doesn't have to become fleshly. It doesn't have to provoke a rivalry between you and your friend, your brother, your ministry partner. But that is all dependent on you and me and how we're going to bear that disagreement with one another. And when a disagreement does unfortunately deform into a fleshly rivalry, well, it's time to resolve that. And it's time to rebuild unity. Let's look at our next word for the vocabulary. Go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Philippians 2, verse 14. So, a disagreement doesn't have to be conflict, and a disagreement doesn't have to be a quarrel, and a disagreement doesn't have to be strife. A disagreement, next, doesn't have to be a dispute. Do all things without grumbling or disputing in Philippians 2.14. The same word is used in 1 Timothy 2.8, and there it's translated dissension. A dispute is the argument that arises out of the disagreement that has gone wrong or that has not been watched over very carefully. Listen, a disagreement with somebody doesn't have to drift into arguing or disputing. It doesn't have to become a dissension. But again, that all depends on how well you and I watch over the disagreement. We need to be thinking the same way about what unity is and what disagreements are and what conflict is and what disputes are. We need to have the same mind about that. But when a disagreement does disintegrate into dissension or disputing, then it's time surely to resolve it and rebuild unity. Let me show you another way to describe it. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Verse 23, you're very familiar with this passage. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. It's not a word, but it's a way of expressing it. Matthew 5, verse 23. If you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother, here it is, has something against you, well, then leave your offering there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering, Jesus says. So a disagreement doesn't have to be a conflict. A disagreement doesn't have to be a quarrel and a disagreement doesn't need to be strife and a disagreement doesn't have to become a dispute and a disagreement doesn't have to be handled in such a way that your ministry partner now has something against you. 
or you have something against them. This having something against your brother is something so undesirable in Jesus' eyes that he says, pull the parking brake on your worship. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want your worship when there's this going on between you and a brother. Disagreement doesn't have to be done in a way that it makes you have something against your brother. It doesn't have to result in your brother holding something against you. Again, we need to be able to disagree in a winsome, humble way with one another. A disagreement doesn't have to descend into the depths of this severity and hinder your worship of Jesus Christ. But that all depends on on how spiritually mature you and I will be in the disagreement. But when and if a disagreement does degenerate such that it makes you hold something against your ministry partner, well then it's time to pull the parking brake on your worship, rebuild unity, and then get back to worshiping Christ together. Let me give you one more this morning. Go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 26. Galatians 5, verse 26. So a disagreement doesn't have to be a conflict. It doesn't have to be a quarrel. A disagreement doesn't have to be strife or a dispute. It doesn't have to go in such a way that it makes you have something against your brother. And then lastly, verse 26 of chapter 5 of Galatians, let us not become those with vain glory. Well, what does it look like when you have empty, an empty pursuit of your own glory? Well, you're going to be challenging one another, challenging one another. The idea involves you calling your teammate forward to a hostile line, a battle line to provoke them. Listen, disagreements can go there. And oftentimes we do that with our disagreements. They can unravel such that you call your ministry partner to the battle line to take up arms against each other. And when we handle disagreement that way, it's time to end the challenge, to end the provocation, and it's time to start rebuilding unity. It's just time to change. It's time to repent. And it's time to humble ourselves before each other and grow in maturity and grow in wisdom. So disagreement doesn't have to become a conflict. A disagreement doesn't have to become a quarrel. It doesn't have to become a strife. It doesn't have to become a dispute. It doesn't have to be done in such a way that you would have something that you would hold against another. It doesn't have to become a challenge or a a provoking of one another. Can you disagree with others well? Can you disagree humbly with each other? Can you disagree winsomely? And listen, listen carefully. When you're in disagreement with a brother or a sister or your ministry partner, can you entrust your ministry partner to God while you disagree. God, I can trust you with this disagreement because you're trustworthy. I'm not trustworthy. My ministry partner's not much more trustworthy than, than I am. But you're trustworthy and I can trust you with the disagreement. Can you do that? Or does it just eat at you that they don't agree with you yet? It doesn't have to be that way. So again, disagreement... In fact, let me ask you this. Have, have, you, ever, have you ever asked your spouse? Have you ever asked your, your, one of your kids? Kids, have you, have you ever asked one of your parents? Have you ever asked your ministry partner? Hey, um, would you tell me what it's, what it's like to disagree with me? I, I need to know. Because I, I want to be winsome in the way, even when I disagree with you. That's a good question to ask. See how lunch goes today when you ask that. So again, disagreement doesn't have, or you're, and don't say, uh, I, cho- I decided today to start fasting. That's, you can't do that. It's not going to work. You're going to get called out on that. Again, disagreement doesn't have to become conflict. Conflict can be avoided even when we disagree with one another. If we're thinking the same way about it, we have to have the same mind about this. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. This is not an exhortation to you to glory in disagreement with one another. Don't hear me saying that. It is not. This is not a training session on how to become a contrarian. It's not. 
To wear disagreement like it's an honorable badge of leadership is an attitude to repent of. Because fellowship and unity is the sweetest where there is the most agreement. And the proof of that is where? Heaven. No disagreements there. And it is the sweetest unity with Christ. But here, with our residual depravity just cluttering the the landscape, ah, there's going to be disagreements. There are. Just don't glory in them. And also, don't turn every single one of them into a conflict. It doesn't have to be that way. All right, that's enough introduction. Look, I have a lot of introductions pent up inside me. So let's go on to, to part here today. Let's talk about a simple biblical survey of unity. Number one, I'm going to give it to you in three parts, okay? Um, A simple biblical survey of unity is we're going to start with unity is inescapable for man, okay? And this is simple. We're not going to be going in every book of the Bible. Just a simple overview of what the Bible says about unity, and we'll start with with this. Unity is inescapable for man. The second one is unity is recoverable in Christ, And then the last one, unity is non-negotiable for believers. So let's start this morning with number one. Unity is inescapable for man. And you can turn to Genesis if you'd like. It doesn't matter who you are. You cannot escape solidarity with others. Did you know that? You cannot escape unity with others. God built into man's spiritual DNA and fabric unity solidarity, unity is inescapable for man. In the garden, before the fall, Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 2, were one flesh. Now just think about it. That is the first and foundational expression that God wanted the first humans to put on display and broadcast to the world. One fleshness. And the rest of humanity was going to come forth out of that one fleshness. That was what God was after. Unity with humanity. That's what he was after. And what was absolutely tragic in Genesis 3, you know, in the fall of Adam and Eve was how inseparable they were in their sin too. There was no division between them prior to sin. They were one flesh. And then there was also no division between them as they sinned. They ate together. They hid from God together. And that united rebellious humanity is what the rest of humanity came out of. What a heartbreak to God. All he wanted was this one fleshness and humanity to come out from that. And instead what happened is this one fleshness and sin and rebellion and spiritual death before God. And that's what humanity came out of instead. Not just different, the opposite. And that united rebellious humanity multiplied all over the earth until the flood in Genesis chapter 6. And God's judgment through the flood was evidence that when he looked on the human race, he saw them as a whole, as a whole race together in their rebellion against him. He saw their solidarity and rebellion against him. The flood was not a selective judgment of this one drowns, that one doesn't, this one drowns, that one doesn't, this one drowns, drown. drown. That's not the way it was. He was greatly offended at what they had all become together against him. And in mercy, he spared Noah and his sons. But the flood, the judgment of God in Genesis 6, did not correct the sinful oneness or solidarity and unity of humanity. The flood was not God's plan to fix that. The cross of his son is where he'll fix that. And that sinful oneness after the flood again took over and it manifested itself boldly at the Tower of Babel. Look at Genesis chapter 11. We'll take a peek at this passage. As I read verses 1 to 4, I want you just to listen to the wholeness language and the sameness language, the oneness language. Look at Genesis 11, 1. Now the whole earth, nobody excluded, the whole earth had the 
same language. And they had the same words. And it happened as they were in that condition that they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one another, they turn inward, they all look at each other, they say, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves. Do you see how they're turned in on themselves in this unity? Let us make for ourselves a name. Why? We don't want to be scattered. We don't want to be scattered over the face of the earth. And so they built this very, 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 very high tower and God had to come down to look at it. Verse 5. And what did God see when he came down? What's his assessment? Look at verse 6. What did he say? Behold, they are what? One people. And they all have the same language. And in this condition, and this is what they have begun to do, so now nothing which they purpose to do in this oneness will be impossible for them. So what's the solution? Was was God's solution at the tower to dig deep into their hearts and undo and recreate the original oneness that God had in mind for them? Nope. God's plan at the tower was not to reverse that sinful oneness. God's plan at the tower was not to recreate a better godly unity because the Tower of Babel is not his solution for man. His son's cross is his solution for you and me. So the tower, at the tower, God obstructed man's ability to unite in rebellion against him as quickly and easily and efficiently as they did before. Verse 7, come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another. See, it blocks their ability to plot together. So Yahweh then, verse 8, scattered them. Verse 9, Yahweh scattered them over the face of the earth. God blunted the threat of their wicked mob mentality. And as we know, God enacted a plan from the the promised seed of the woman. And turn a page to Genesis chapter 12 that, that, that picks up in Abraham. And one day through this seed of Abraham, all of the nations will be gathered into a unified blessing under the seed of Abraham. But even Abraham's family nation, as it grew, it was devastatingly affected by this. Turn to Numbers chapter 14. Israel was not immune to this. Israel is a part of this humanity. Numbers 14, verse 35. This is after the spies were sent into the land of promise. They returned back with a bad report. And God said this about that evil congregation, that they were gathered together against me, Yahweh said. Verse 35. And then at Korah's rebellion, go to chapter 16, verse 3. At Korah's awful rebellion, it says in verse 3 that they assembled together against Moses and Aaron. Look down at verse 11. Therefore, you and all your congregation are gathered together against Yahweh. Look at verse 19. Korah assembled all the congregation against them. You see, built into the fabric of individual hearts, into my heart and into your heart, and then also built in across the breadth of all of humanity is this eagerness in us to not just express my own individual hostility toward God, but man, do we like to be a mob together doing it. That's what's unfolding in your Old Testament. And Israel had to deal with it. And even then when Korah gets judged and and God's judgment of sinful unified Israel happened, it didn't change their sinful oneness. Look on the very next day, chapter 16, verse 41. On the next day, what do they do? They've learned nothing because they can't resist this thing that's inside them. On the very next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. (laughs) They just can't give it up. And this dreadful unity conditioned, uh, condition continued across all of humanity. Go to Psalm 14. Turn to Psalm 14. Look at God's assessment. Psalm 14, verse 2. You're going to hear some of the same kind of tower language here. Psalm 14, verse 2. Yahweh, what? 
looks down. He's still looking down. Like when they were trying to build a tower and going up, he came down. He looks down from heaven upon the sons of men. Has anything changed? What is this humanity like? He looks to see if there's anyone who has insight. Is there anyone who seeks after God? His conclusion, his assessment, they all have turned aside. All together, they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Go to Psalm 53. This is so important in the Psalms that it's recorded twice. Psalm 53, verse 2, God looks down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there's anyone who has insight, anyone who seeks after God. Every one of them has turned back. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul picks this up in Romans chapter 3. Turn there with me. Romans chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says, what then? Are we Jews better? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Remember, God's looking down. Is there anyone? There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. That is the refrain of the Bible on our unity. When God looks on sinful humans, he's just looking, is there even one who's broken off from them and different? Is there even one? And his answer, not one. They're all together on this. They're all together. Unity is inescapable for man in his sin. When God looks on sinful humans, he doesn't primarily see individual, loosely connected sinners. He doesn't look at a gravel road with a lot of different pebbles all over it, down it. He sees I-10 cemented together. That's what he sees. And all of humanity is in a solidarity crisis of rebellion against him. So pre-fall, unity was inescapable. They were one flesh. Post-fall, Unity and solidarity with one another was still inescapable, and that's the bad news. That takes us to number two. Unity is actually recoverable in Christ. Number two, unity is recoverable in Christ. So the expulsion of sinful man from the garden was not God's solution for this solidarity problem. The flood was not God's solution to the solidarity that is wicked in man. The Tower of Babel was not God's solution to the sinful oneness of self-exalting man. Punishment in the wilderness against Israel was not the solution. The unity God intended to restore in sinful man could only be achieved by one, and that is the man who is unlike all of the rest, who actually is broken off from them and different, but fully human, truly man. The God-man Jesus, the promised seed of the woman, And Jesus actually predicted that he would do this. Look at John chapter 10. Smed pointed this out to us last week. Look at John chapter 10. Jesus predicted that he would do this oneness thing. John chapter 10, verse 16, he said, I have other sheep which are not from this fold, which is Israel, and I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become what? One flock with one shepherd over them. One flock with one shepherd over them. John confirms this in his own little editorial note in chapter 11, verse 52. Um, Caiaphas said this. He prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into what? One, the children of God who are scattered abroad. You hear the language, the similar expression of man scattered And then brought together as one. But not only did Jesus predict this was coming, he prayed for it. Look at John chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus prayed for this unity. Look at John 17, verse 20. He said to the Father, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but I ask for those who also will believe in me through their word. And I pray this, that they may all be what? One. To what standard should they be one? Here it is. Even as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. Wow, that's a pretty solidified solidarity. I want them to be one like that. 
that they may also then, get this, be in us. Not just be one together, but be one in us. The glory, verse 22, which you have given me, I've given to them, that they may be one. Again, what's the standard for this oneness? Just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. This is what he's praying for. Now, I left out the two so that. What's the so that in verse 20? They need to be one so that what? The world may believe that you sent me. That's what Jesus is praying to the Father. I want the world to believe that you, Father, sent me to the earth. Verse 23, what's the so that? So that the world may know, Father, that you sent me and that you loved them even as you have loved me. The believability of Jesus being sent into the world by the Father is actually aided by this recoverable unity that he's going to achieve. Now, let me ask you, can you toy around with that unity? Can we neglect it? Is it negotiable? It's not at all. It's something we must cherish and protect. And Jesus described the other side of that. He described what it would actually be like for him to go into that sinful, cemented solidarity of oneness of those sinners and take his sinners out and make them his own. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Look how he describes the other side of this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. <laughs> Look at this. Jesus said, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not. I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Listen, Jesus did not step toward the sinful, cemented oneness of the earth and say, you know what, I think we can, I can work with this. Let's, let's, make a, let's make a peace treaty here. He didn't come to make peace with that because it's absolutely incompatible with him because it's in rebellion against him. But he came with a sword drawn to tear it apart so that he could tear you out of it, believer. And there would be a consequence that the world will not like losing you. And there will be hatred and you will become an enemy to them. So Jesus predicted this unity, he prayed for this unity, and he revealed that it would create hostility in the world. And that takes us to Romans chapter 5. Turn there with me. Paul paints the big picture in Romans chapter 5 of how Jesus and the unifying of his people that he is making is far greater than the sinful unifying mess that Adam made of all of his people. See, I've had those two solidarities now that are being contrasted. Let's talk about first the dreadful solidarity in Adam. Look at Romans 5.15. I'm going to move quickly through this. We don't have a ton of time. There's a sermon you can go back and listen to on this if you want. Look at verse 15. If by the one, that's Adam, the many died. Wait a minute. One guy dies and one, one man um. What's it say? By the one guy, everybody dies? Yeah, that's a solidarity that's tough to live with, isn't it? No exceptions. We are all cemented together in that death. Look at verse 16. The judgment arose from the one transgression. Wait a minute. One guy transgressed and, tr and condemnation and judgment is for all? Yes. Inescapable. A tragic sentence hanging over every single one of us. Verse 17. By the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. So we are now all underneath the reign of that death in Adam. Solidarity that you cannot escape. Verse 18. Through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. That's horrible. There's no escaping that condemnation if you are in Adam. Romans 5.19, through one man's disobedience, the many were appointed sinners. What a tragic, one-size-fits-all appointment for the many united sinners of Adam. And it's inescapable and it's tragic. Every part of that description is horrible. But what a contrast Jesus Christ is for his recovered, united people in him. Look at the hope-giving solidarity in Christ. Go back to verse 15. 
the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, did abound to many. So he comes with grace and it abounds to his many. It abounds to us. This recovered unity is under grace. It's not under death, but only in Christ. Verse 16, the gracious gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Gracious gift, this gift of grace comes and it means that there is a declaration of righteousness standing over us, a recovered unity that is beautiful and pleasing to the Lord, but only in Christ. Romans 5, 17, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So this recovered unity, it means that we get to reign in life through Jesus rather than death reigning over us. Do you understand that? Death was reigning over us. We now are reigning through life in Christ. What a solidarity that we have, but only in Christ. Romans 5.18, through the one act of righteousness, that's Christ, there resulted for all the rest, justification of life to many. Wow, this recovered unity, it ushers us into a real life that is lived out under that declaration of righteousness, but only in Christ. And then verse 19, through the obedience of the one, the many will be appointed righteous. Again, this is recovered unity with a righteous status over it that God smiles upon, and it's only in Christ, only in Christ. So you see, for unbelieving man, solidarity with other sinful men was and is inescapable. But now, because of Christ and his powerful grace, unity for believers is also inescapable for us. The idea is not just that a sinful man is in solidarity with Adam as an individual, but he is in solidarity with all the rest of the sinners in Adam. And the idea is not just that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you individually are in solidarity with Christ. You are, but you are in solidarity with all the rest of the believers in Christ. Unity is inescapable. We are never loose We are never disconnected individuals. We are not a gravel road in Christ. We are a new freeway cemented together, embedded with one another in Christ. You are either embedded in a oneness for condemnation and death, or you are embedded in a oneness with justification in life. It's either in Adam or it's in Christ. And it doesn't matter who you are as a human being, unity is inescapable. But unity, true unity, is recoverable, but only in Christ. Just how did Jesus form that new embedded humanity? Go to Ephesians 2, he tells us. Ephesians 2, verse 13. Again, this is just a biblical survey of of unity. Ephesians 2 verse 13. How how did he do this? But now in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. There it is. He did it by the blood of his cross, by his substitutionary death in our place. Paul says as a believing Jew, he himself is our peace. Believing Gentile, I'm a believing Jew. He is our peace. He is the one who made both groups one and broke down the dividing wall of the partition by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the the law of commandments contained in ordinances. He did that so that in himself he might create the two into not something recognizable from the Old Testament, Not something familiar that they had seen before, but something brand new that he had never done before. He broke that down and he made them into one new man making peace and that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, having in himself put to death the enmity. That's how he did it. In himself at the cross, He made something new, a recovered humanity, a recovered unity that nobody had ever seen before. 
It wasn't at the tower. It wasn't at the flood. It wasn't in the wilderness. It wasn't outside the garden. It was at the cross that this is being achieved. So clearly John 17 got to this in Jesus prayer. We have this unity with one another, but only because he first united us with him. Jesus doesn't come to us all now as separate little gravel pieces on a gravel road. And he doesn't say, okay, uh, wow, you're all forgiven. And man, look at you. You're all so different. Um, you know what? Here's what we need to do next. Jesus, by the way, doesn't say this, right? I'm just making sure this is clear. I think you can tell by my tone. You guys, y'all, y'all look for ways in which you can have something in common with each other. Look for things that will help glue you together. I don't know, maybe th- think of like what your interests are. See if you can bond together on that. Jesus doesn't leave that with you. He doesn't put that obligation on you. Jesus conditioned our unity with each other, not on your ability to find good reasons to be together. He conditioned his, our unity with one another on himself. Jesus himself gave us what we need in common. Do you know what I need in common with you? Jesus, and that's what you need in common with me, Christ. He conditioned our unity with one another on himself. So we only have this unity with one another because we have union with Christ. So here's my question. How strong then is this unity or this union with Christ that we have? It's our foundation. It's foundational to our unity with one another, right? How strong is it then to support our unity with one another? If our unity with one another is dependent on that unity, how tightly bound to Christ are we? What if if we can actually be separated from him? What does that then mean for our unity together? And you know that Paul has something to say about that. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 35. And speaking about their union with Christ, our union with Christ, what does he say? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? There's nothing. He's got a long list. He finishes. None of these things will be able to separate us from the love of God. Listen, I know the primary point of Romans 8 is not talking about horizontal unity, but it is an inescapable implication for our unity with one another. If the greater unity that we have with Christ cannot be undone, then our unity together stands a chance. It stands a chance, doesn't it? And that means, lastly, number three, unity is non-negotiable for believers. If God created man to just have built into him this fabric and the spiritual DNA of solidarity with one another, but especially if, as believers, he recreated us in Christ to never be able to escape unity with one another in him, then we who have believed Christ, we cannot negotiate away unity, fellowship, and love. Does that make sense? Do you understand that? Listen, again, the impossible work of that foundational positional unity has already been done by Christ to make us one with him and therefore with each other. He is not burdening you or me with that task. That task is over. That task is done. Then what is our load to carry? It is this, in the power of his grace, it is to live in alignment with that foundation that we're standing on. It is to practice unity on the Christ-established unity foundation that he achieved. That's our obligation. And we have every reason to believe that we have the resources from him to do it. We have every resource to practice that unity on our positional Christ-established unity foundation. There's hope for us, guys. There's hope for us that we can do that together. There's absolutely no reason for you to think that he will make you come up short in trying to achieve unity with one another. Why? Why would he recreate us in Christ to form an inseparable, positional, unchanging union with him and with each other, but then leave you hanging with no resources to carry it out? Does that sound like him? And then let's just be sobered by this. If we thoughtlessly 
distance ourselves from one another. If we carelessly turn our backs on one another, if we withhold ourselves from each other as we stand on his Christ-established positional unchanging unity foundation, well, we are a living contradiction to what he accomplished and that he wants from us. We're standing on a slab that says Christ achieved, Christ glorifying, solidarity with him and with one another, but we've got our backs turned to one another. And we have every reason to believe that he grieves over that separation and that unresolved conflict on his son's unity foundation. And so let's then not just be sobered by that, but let's be encouraged by this. If anyone has hope that unity lost can indeed be rebuilt, guess who it is? It's us. If there's anybody who has hope to rebuild a broken relationship, it is us. It is us. Your conflict with another believer is not the end of the road. Look down. Look underneath you. Look at the foundation, the positional foundation of unity that you have in him and with each other that he established. Do you think that you cannot rebuild on that unchanging positional Christ-established unity foundation? Think even before you were saved. Your sin at the first and the conflict that stirred up between you and God, that was not the end of your road. He has the ability and had the ability to overcome that. Are you prepared now to say as a believer, well, but you don't know this conflict I'm having with another believer, and I just think it's different. I think it's irreparably damaged. Really? How we live with each other, it must be a reflection of that unchanging, positional, Christ-established unity foundation that we're both standing on. And this is why you are always either building unity on that foundation or you are trying to rebuild it by God's grace on that foundation. That's why those two things are non-negotiable. The early church got this. Let me give you some examples of this. Go to Acts chapter 2. You know this. Verse 42. We'll let these passage be, passages be descriptive for us. And they, Acts 2, 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the fellowship. They were continually devoting themselves to the fellowship that seemed right on that unity foundation that we should just be continually devoting ourselves to one another, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Verse 44, all of those who had believed were together. They had all things in common. Verse 46, daily devoting themselves with one accord in the temple. They had one mind about this, unity. They were breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness, sincerity of heart. Chapter 4, verse 32 says the same thing. The congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And now watch, this is almost the exact opposite of Psalm 14. And not one was saying that anything Uh, Any of his possessions was his own, but for them, everything was in common. Now you can't find in this solidarity one broken off. How strange it would be for believers in Jesus Christ, standing on Christ's unchanging positional unity foundation, to actually not want to be together. That makes no sense. Now let me give you some prescriptive passages. Go to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Let's show and demonstrate from the Bible how this is non-negotiable, this unity. Boy, this poor church in Corinth, Corinth, they, they sabotaged their own unity over and over. Even though they had Christ's unchanging positional unity foundation under them, they divided into schisms. They divided into factions. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's talk about losing your mind for just a moment. I mean, that's what we do sometimes. We, we forget what we're standing on, and we do this thing that we feel like is so right, and we're so passionate about it, and we chain ourselves to it, and we have to form this little group over here against that little group over there. 
Paul says, chapter 13, verse 11, Finally, brothers, brothers, rejoice. Be restored. Be comforted. Be like-minded. Think the same way about this. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Bring your daily living with one another back into alignment with this foundation because unity is non-negotiable for you. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, you know the main exhortation here is to walk worthy of the calling. Chapter 4 verse 1, with which you have been called. What what does that look like? How does that flesh itself out? Verse 3, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And we are being built up in the body of Christ, right? Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. In fact, here's how we are not to be scattered anymore in this condition. Verse 14, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves carried about by every wind of doctrine. This is why sound doctrine is key and crucial to our unity together because false doctrine scatters us, splits us up. And this whole body, verse 16, is being joined and held together. You see, this is the foundation underneath us. This is what we have. This is what we are. Now look over at verse 25. This is interesting. Look at the last part of verse 25. Let's start there. We are members of one another. That's looking down. That's looking down at the foundation that Jesus accomplished. Look down. We are members of one another. Oh, yeah, my life is connected. We're like members of a body together. That's right. Okay, so how should I act in alignment with that? The first part of verse 25. Laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Because of that foundation. You see how we live in alignment with the foundation of unity underneath us. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Paul, again, I think in verse 1, is telling them, in a sense, to look down at their foundation. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ down there, or since there is, and since there is any consolation of love down there, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit down there, if there's any affection and compassion that you have for one another in this fellowship with the Spirit, what should we do? How should we live in alignment with that? Fulfill my joy that you think the same way. Be of the same mind about this. Maintaining the same love that's crucial for this. Being united in spirit, thinking on one purpose. And one of the ways you can do that is doing nothing from selfishness or selfish ambition or vain glory, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves. Not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this way of thinking in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. You notice the thinking words there? Think the same way, verse 2. Thinking on one purpose. Verse 3, the humility of mind. Verse 5, have this way of thinking. I wonder where the battle for living out unity with each other begins. I'll tell you where it begins. It begins with right thinking. Being of the same mind about unity. Practicing unity with each other on Christ's unchanging positional unity will be impossible if you think differently about it. You need the same mind on unity. Unity is non-negotiable for us. One more. Go to Philippians 4, verses 1 to 3. Living in alignment with the unity foundation that Christ achieved under us, it begins with that right thinking together. We have to think the same way about our unity And that right thinking about unity is never to be assumed that if it's there once, it will always be there. Because that kind of thinking about unity can be lost, even by faithful servants of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, or chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, loved and longed for my joy and crown in this way. Stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to think the same way In the Lord. Indeed, I ask you also, genuine companion, help these women who, what what were these women like? They are women who have contended, watch this, together alongside of me in the gospel, Paul says, and other people. These two women needed help. 
Because what at one point was a contending together for the gospel alongside Paul is now gone. They need to think the same way again. Sometimes we're going to need someone else to step in and help us rebuild unity. That's what Paul is saying. And there's no shame in that. There's only hope in that if we can get somebody else to help us. Just because we might be faithfully contending together in gospel ministry together, it doesn't mean that we are immune to disunity. A good start doesn't guarantee that we'll always be doing a Christ-honoring unity. These women had probably amazing memories together of what it was like to be side-by-side alongside Paul in Philippi contending for the gospel And here they are now in conflict of some sort. And guess what? This is what happens this side of heaven. This is just what happens this side of heaven. This is what we unfortunately do to each other and with each other sometimes. Paul wants these women to be helped back to unity because unity is non-negotiable for us. Rebuild it. And by rebuilding it, it doesn't mean that these two women have to go back to the way that it was before they broke up. It needs to go forward to a better and new unity. I want to finish with looking at two passages, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. Go to Psalm 133. We're almost done. You have been very brave to survive this simple so-called biblical survey. Listen, conflict, as you're turning there, Psalm 133, conflict and, and disunity is wearying. It is discouraging. It drains you. And maybe you've forgotten how appealing and how delightful, how enjoyable, how pleasurable unity and peacemaking actually is. Here's the Old Testament's testimony on this. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the good oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountain of, mountains of Zion. For there Yahweh commanded the blessing, life forever. So at a location, God promised and commanded the blessing that is full of life. And it is pleasant there for God's people to be dwelling together in unity. It's good. It's good. And what a great example for us in scripture. David here is actually modeling in worship that it's good for us to declare this to one another. As teammates, as ministry partners, as spouses, we need to hear one another say how good and pleasant it is to be united with you. I really enjoy the oneness of life and the oneness of ministry alongside you. One of the best parts of this difficult week for me has been that I have not been alone. I've been with you. Are we saying that to one another enough? What if we said it more? Wouldn't that make conflict when it arises increasingly seem just that's unsuitable? What is that doing here? Let's get rid of that. And go to the New Testament passage on this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. You know it. In the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed, truly happy of soul are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Well, of course, knowing what you know now, the truly happy of soul believer is the one who rebuilds unity when it's lost, is the one who makes peace. Listen, there, this, this should give you the most hope out of anything. <laughs> there is a real and genuine and soul happiness that is awaiting us where there is disunity. There is. Do you want it? Do you want that soul happiness? Then go and make peace. Go and make peace. And there's a family resemblance when we make peace where conflict has arisen. They shall be called sons of God. You look like God when you do that. Do you want to look like your heavenly father in conflict? Go make peace. And what has Jesus not provided for you to be successful in it? 
Look at the unity foundation underneath you. What are we waiting for? What if in conflict, we actually met each other on the way and said, friend, this is actually a great opportunity for us to be truly happy. Let's get rid of this conflict. I want that soul happiness together with you. Let's pray together. Father, again, I know what a liability I am to all of this. My own relationship with you and my relationship with my wife, with my kids, with my friends who bear with me. Lord, it's just unfortunately and sadly still present within me this and within all of us, this, how easy it is to just sabotage unity, to turn anything into a challenge, to turn anything into a battle that doesn't need to be there. And so, Father, I pray that as we think about what your Bible says about unity, Lord, and what is underneath us in Christ as a foundation, oh, Lord, would you help us to humble ourselves there, to rejoice in what you have accomplished for us and to rejoice that we have all of the resources that are there to help us overcome our depravity by your grace, not by our strength, but by your spirit's power and your word's help. We can overcome anything. If you can overcome your own wrath against me, whatever I'm upset with in my ministry partner, that's a piece of cake to get over. Would you convince us of that again? Make us truly happy as we make peace. Let us tell one another how good and pleasant it is to be united together. Lord, may we hear that from one another. May that be a refrain that comes forth from Grace Bible Church. And on every ministry team sent to the ends of the earth. And we ask it in Christ's great name. Amen.